what will be the mass angry reaction to that? And might it be a rebellion in one place or multiple places? And I think we have to get ready for that. Because if there is a rebellion, our responsibility as revolutionaries will be threefold at a minimum, to explain it, to defend it, and help it. I think in the coming days and weeks, that should be uppermost on our mind. But let's, let's get back to this whole question of, is this an Arab Spring for oppressed black and brown youth? When I think of the Arab Spring analogy, of course you think of Tunisia and Egypt and Tahrir Square, and it means to me that something has happened, an outrage. In Tunisia it was uh, the, uh, the young worker setting himself on fire because he was spit upon and because he was treated so badly as a poor, struggling, and desperate merchant. That was just the outrage, but it was just a, that, it was an outrage, but it was just the catalyst for evoking something deeper, conditions that had not been addressed, that provoked hundreds of thousands and millions to rise up. And for that uprising not to end, but to continue and deepen and spread throughout the region. That's what the Arab Spring analogy means to me. It happened a little bit in the UK in August. Sometimes it's police violence that is the outrage that sort of breaks the camel's back. A, a, a London cop killed a young African man. That was the outrage. But there was a rebellion that started in London and raised throughout the whole UK for more than a week. And everybody knew that while the killing of that African man was the catalyst, it was the austerity and the poverty and the unemployment that was driving the rebellion. So what is the deeper issues for the part of the working class that, that Trayvon Martin once belonged to? This is a pretty big slice of the working class, comrades and friends. It's about 45 to 50 million strong. I'm talking about young black and brown workers, be they employed or unemployed. Most of them are unemployed. A lot of them are in jail. Between the ages of roughly the mid-teens and maybe the late 20s, early 30s. What we know about this section of our class is that conditions for them have become worse and more desperate. They always were bad, and they've been getting worse for many decades now. But especially in the wake of this global capitalist crisis of the last few years, the conditions have driven off a cliff. A lot of times when we refer to this section of the working class, we talk about the quote unquote war against youth. Whether we say it or not, it's war against black youth. I would add black and brown youth. And we go over you know, what that constitutes. What, what is that war? More of them in jail in many cities than having jobs. We go back to all the, these uh, drug laws that were passed, the Rockefeller law, which was duplicated throughout the country, which has been the legal excuse to just have an assembly line of sending young black and brown people to jail at an early age and keeping them there and throwing away the key. And then, of course, there's the austerity. Get back to that, because that's deepening. Particularly the austerity as it relates to education, which is being basically taken away, public education. Black and brown young people 
who are not privileged are basically being deprived of any public education in a systematic way. And then there's what I would call the real big issue, and that's devastating hyper-depression level unemployment. Unimaginable unemployment amongst this sector of the working class. There are many arguments over just how bad it is. I'm not even sure what the so-called official statistics are. I think that may be 23% or 30%, but people who really study unemployment amongst this sector of the working class, they think it's more like between 40 and as high as 70%. That, that is, I mean, wrap your head around that. That means most everybody does not have a job. They're not looking for a job. No job exists. If they're lucky enough to find a job, you know what kind of job that is. And it usually doesn't last very long. See? See? The big question somebody should be asking is, why is this not a big issue? I don't know how many conferences mainstream civil rights groups have called, community groups, well-intentioned people have called about this, this huge in-your-face crisis of depression-level unemployment amongst young black and brown people. It's been around for a while. It's getting worse, but it's been around. But no one seems to be able to make it an issue. There is a reason for this, comrades. It's because the system does not want it to be an issue. If they wanted it to be an issue, they would make it an issue, just like they make Osama bin Laden an issue, or, or you know, Iran and let's go to war with them an issue, or whatever they want to make an issue. They don't want to make this horrendous crisis an issue because they can't solve it, capitalism can't solve it, and they don't want to solve it. The fact of the matter is capitalism has written off this section of our class. They can no longer provide jobs. It's one of the reasons why they're not working hard to provide schools, because you only provide schools to sections of the working class that you're going to exploit. If you've written off a section of the working class, that's when you start closing their schools, whether it's based on budgets or whatever else. That's when you start closing down housing. We don't need schools or housing or any services. We don't need subways going to their neighborhoods because we, we don't have uh, uh, the basis for exploiting them. So basically, they're non-existent. In many ways, in many ways, Capitalism has condemned large sections of this part of the working class that we're addressing to social and political death. They're living, but they're socially and politically dead. And I know that to some extent, whether it's outright or whether it's implicit, the reason why some of them don't pull up their pants and it's hanging lower, you know, around there, you know what, and the reason why some of them wear hoodies is because it's defiance. They know that they've been outcasts. You don't have standing anymore because we cannot exploit you. You're insignificant. You might as well be dead. They know it. They know how they're treated. And I think sometimes those hoodies are sort of their way of saying, well, you know, you. We understand exactly what society has done to us. We didn't do it. The system has done it. And so if you want us to wear our hoodie as a badge of honor, then, you know, we'll do it. I'm not saying that accounts for all of it. Some of it just is good wear. <laughs> and it's nice to have a hood if it's raining or cold. But some of it is, some of it's this. It's a, it's a, it's a statement. The question now is, how does a section of our class that has been condemned to a social death, how does it fight this death? The only way to do it is to rise up. Rise up and say, I'm alive and I demand this and that and jobs and so forth. To do what the immigrants did. They had their immigrant spring. Talk about the Arab spring. Remember the immigrant spring of 2006? 
conditions for immigrant workers are different. Just as bad, and in some ways worse, but different. Super exploited. But up until 2006, kind of quiet. No voice. Nobody paid attention. Then all of a sudden, they rose up. And they had their May Day when they had something that looked like the biggest general strike that this country has seen in 100 years. Hey, I think that young black and brown workers may be facing a similar situation. It's hypothetical. It may not happen. Whether or not this struggle that Trayvon's case has opened up, it may be like a lot of cases. And I hear this from a lot of black activists that I've talked to. They're already getting a little cynical about it. Well, something will happen and then somebody will change the subject. And like many other cases before, it'll go away. You know, so don't, don't have too many expectations about all of these youth who are moving in the streets of New York and, and, and Baltimore and Florida and other places staying in the streets. You know, some of the same contradictions and problems that keep them passive and preoccupied with smaller things, well, they're liable to, you know, prevail, you know, sooner than later. Maybe that's true, but suppose it doesn't happen. Suppose this struggle that's opened up does deepen, doesn't go away like that. I think we ought to prepare for that. I think